This is the My Michelle Live podcast. Weekend Review. A look back at the week. It's My Michelle, Michelle Live, Live Weekend Review. Review. Here's Michelle. Michelle and my cohort, my co-host, my man at the side, on that side if you're watching, we are Michelle and Adam, and we review the week, taking a look at all of the issues and some of the biggest issues that took place this week, unspinning them and maybe putting them in perspective with another perspective. Thank you for joining in today. Today, you are going to hear about the economy, gun control, some of the craziest things. If, if California wasn't crazy enough, the Republic of California has just gone off the deep end. We're going to talk about some of those things, but we're going to bring it into perspective with a deeper story. We call it the God story. Story. But first, I just wanted to, Adam, I had to pay tribute. So you've yes. seen these pictures, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, of course. Oh, we just, everybody knows we just went through Memorial Day. We just had the Memorial Day holiday recently. And I was asking Michelle this. I was like, why is Memorial Day just one day, but Pride is a whole month? Look at these photos here. You have this what I believe to be a widow laying on a blanket at Arlington National Cemetery with a child and a baby carrier next to her. And she's face down towards the grave of her fallen soldier, her husband, I, I believe in this photo. That's what this is, right? The Memorial Day is about remembering our fallen soldiers, those who have gone to fight for our ability to talk right now with you, for our ability to work towards a better life. And I think that it's ridiculous that we don't have more of a pause, I think, to recognize the cost of war and the cost of our decisions. And the thing that we have to thank our veterans for, of course, is for being brave enough and willing to to go to bat for us when nobody else would. And, and it's shameful, too, that some of our, our, of our military conflicts and some of our losses of life, rightfully, we ask why. We think about the Afghanistan pullout, just that botched job where we lost, I think, what, 13 Marines unnecessarily just absolute tragedies that are in some cases avoidable. So I think recognizing that our decisions do have real consequences and understanding that Memorial Day is about honoring those who have fallen in defense of our country. We have to be really picky about when we choose to pick up that rifle and when we choose to get on that C-130 and go overseas to, to wage war, especially now as we have Russia and Ukraine in a very hot situation. Could that lead to World War Three? I God, I hope not. Yeah. I hope not. But these are real things that happen in our world that we have to really come to terms with. When we look at these uh, photos and if you're just listening and, and not viewing, you can go to My Michelle Live and see, but there are uh, people just crouched before grave sites. Uh, you can see the angst. You can feel the pain. These are people who were willing to lay down their lives for the freedoms that you enjoy, for the even the freedom to burn and disrespect the flag. They fought for that. <clears throat> Keep that in mind. When we look at the state of the military, I'm just going to ask this in the wake of Memorial Day to pray for those who are in service. It's a difficult time. COVID and a lot of the policies under this administration has made the rules and the standards pretty lax. There's no standards with hair anymore. There's no, you know, men can wear fingernail polish. There's no standards with physicality. So physical fitness, there's really no standard anymore. The uh, discipline it, it has become very lax because, well, we don't want to stress people out. I mean, remember the stress cards? So you go, you get into battle and you're like, oh, oh wait, time out. I don't like this. I don't feel comfortable <laughs> wait, wait, wait. right now. Where's my safe space, I need my, I need my puppies <laughs> and my crayons and my safe space. That's where we're at. Can you imagine, Michelle, you're in a hot zone and all of a sudden you're like, Sarge, wait, I got to go to my safe space real fast. <laughs> like, man... <laughs> We, I laugh at it, but it's sad. And that's not indicative of everyone who's serving. I want to let you know. But for those who take it seriously, pray for our military. Now, Indeed. what well, are they... Real fast, Michelle, too, just before we, we jump into... Yes. Biden inflation. <laughs> yeah, pray for our military. Reflect on those who have passed. And for God's sakes, thank those who are currently serving. I have a cousin right now... Um, overseas and 
Many of my family have served and, and fought in, in wars past. The thing that I think we don't do enough of is we don't take care of our veterans the way we should. And, and that's a real shame. We're sitting here worrying about sending billions of dollars to, to Ukraine, but we still have a huge problem with the mental health and frankly, homelessness among veterans. So don't forget about our guys. Let's take care of them. No, we love you and thank you. We thank you so much. You have paid a debt that we can't repay. And in the wake of Memorial Day, we will not forget. And I guess it begs the question, what are they still fighting for? <laughs> because it seems like there's a lot of wonky stuff going on in the nation today. You mentioned Biden inflation. And uh, <laughs> it, yeah, it's, it's a so, thing. Biden inflation is a thing that's been trending this week, and he, he's going to tell you, oh, it's Putin's fault, but we know better. <laughs> Pass the, the buck. The thing that, I, that really caught my attention this week, apart from filling up my truck, it, it now costs me about 100 bucks just to fill up my truck each time. And, and, and that's a reality that I have to deal with every week. So just add 400 bucks a month to the budget. And that's something that is leaving people in a position where they're just like, can I afford to drive to work this week or this month? Do I really make enough? Because my dollar doesn't go quite as far. Michelle, I heard an indication that by late fall, a carton of eggs could be as high as 12 bucks, uh, literally a dollar per egg. When I go to the grocery store now, it depends on what I'm getting, like the super, the <clears> super <throat> fancy free range organic kind around four or five bucks. And then, but you can get a carton of eggs for around three to four dollars right now. But the price of food <clears throat> is it, going up big time. The price of gas right now, insanely high, as I just mentioned, seeing an average of almost five bucks a gallon. And in the other areas, you're flirting with six dollars a gallon. Ooh, that is insane. Right? When you think about shipping costs, right? Gas costs more, so it's going to cost more to ship those goods. Just the cost to do everything because of that price of gas and, and fuel it is inflated. And so it's really funny when you see the energy secretary saying that Biden is obsessed with lowering these outrageous gas prices. Because on day one of his presidency, he basically shut down the Keystone Pipeline. Uh, and just totally killed confidence in any private company's ability to invest into expanding our ability to produce gas, right, within this country alone. We do have abundant energy sources here in the United States. We literally have the, the strongest, most abundant uh, natural resources in the world, if you really think about it. But we don't tap into that. Yeah, we, well, we could. there's so much that we can do. And it's interesting that the energy secretary says the president can't do anything about gas prices and everything that's coming out of the administration is it's not my fault. It's not my fault. And I don't care if you're on the left, right side of the aisle or if you're just sitting in, in between going, what the hell? <laughs> when you look at, at what's taking place, I don't want someone in leadership that says it's his fault. He did it. <clears throat> and, and it happens with every administration. And every time it happens, it is a travesty. Whatever exactly. happened to the buck stops here? You mentioned we have abundant U.S. energy resources, the most abundant in the world. We could have a permit uh, to use the pre-existing approved leases on Anwar in Alaska to put volume into the Alaskan oil pipeline. It's completely underutilized. We could finish the Dakota access pop pipeline. We could reapprove the pre-existing energy energy leases well, in New Mexico and, by the way, and other Michelle, places in the Gulf. Think about the cost to transport fuel on a truck from those places to like to mainland America, to the coastline. You're talking about literally using fuel to transport fuel versus a pipeline with zero emissions. <laughs> It's just, it's counter logical and to look, say, oh, kill the pipeline. Bad I'm up here in the gorgeous Northwest and we care about the environment here. We're, we're some of those wackos. Okay. And man, I think we need to be good stewards. I, I don't feel comfortable with, you, you see the ships that carry oil and the big Valdez disasters that, that we right. can have. Those things are real. But when you put it into perspective and realize we're getting our fuel from somewhere and if we're getting it from from Russia, if we're getting it from the from the other Can't areas like Iran, potentially? Saudi Arabia, oh they don't care about the environment. They'll light those things up if they feel it's going to be an advantage to their politics. They don't care. Here, we are going to have wacko extremist environmentalists who care about nature, who err on the side of man shouldn't even be here on the planet, watching that stuff like a hawk, and they should be good for them because that will keep that, that is another safety guard. Think about Definitely. that as we're looking at flirting with uh six dollars a gallon and most of the um 
the pumps throughout the country, Adam, have been reset so that now it can go up to $10 a gallon. Oh, oh my, my gosh. gosh. Do you think we'll get there? Oh, it's very possible that we could. <sighs> But that would be absolutely nuts. I, the funny thing is, so the, the solution to that, right? You're seeing these far left elitists saying, oh, go buy, go buy an EV, go get an, an electric vehicle, which cost, by the way, is twice the cost of a gas powered economy vehicle. Okay, well, let me just pull 60 grand out of the air and go buy a Tesla for, oh, you know what? They'll make it 75 or 80. Let's just go buy, <laughs> go buy a Tesla. Go. It, it's insane that the solution to, high energy costs and high gas pricing is literally to go and <clears throat> spend a bunch of money that we just don't have. But like the dollar today is worth 68 cents relative to the year 2000. And that's a real shame. And we have to get away from that. Yeah, it's the uh, economy it's, it's literally stupid. weakening our position in the world. And it's not just gas. Americans are going to face rising electricity prices in the coming months. If we're, you're going to be paying for it. So break out the candles, sweetheart. It's going to be yeah. a, well, an expensive Michelle, you're, fall. You're kind of lucky because we're in your neck of the woods in the Pacific Northwest. <clears throat> you can at least on a nice day just open the windows for some for some, for a nice breeze. Where I'm at in Texas, man, like. At literally at 11 o'clock at night, it's still 98 degrees and humid at 11 o'clock at night. And I know that because I remember being a kid growing up here and at the time, like going on walks with whoever the girlfriend was at the time. And it's real hard to be cool when you're just like sweating and you shouldn't be right. You're just trying to, you're just trying to play it cool, but dude, it's so hot. And so we have to rely on tons of air conditioning to try and just make things uh, inhabitable. I don't know how people, frankly, I don't know how people lived in Texas, like before the- Seriously, the right? It's just like you, the people must have just been sitting around in their own sweat. Just like, man, you smell. You know what, buddy? You smell too. Okay, I guess we smell. All right. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know? maybe but, we're whips. But that's it. Like we're going to be paying crazy energy costs just to refrigerate, at least where I'm at, my neck of the woods. But then, of course, from that comes winter, right? That's going to be super expensive as well. I know it. Uh, my in-laws were talking about dropping like 1200 bucks to fill up the natural gas that they use to, to heat their, their house. And, and that's like a monthly. Let's cost. hope they can afford it because a lot of people can't. So look, the other problems that you are going to be facing with rising gas costs, the costs of fuel, the cost of electricity is the cost at the supermarket, folks. It's not looking good. Oh my gosh. Yeah. The, the, okay. So I didn't even really know about this concept until I started like looking into it. The idea of food inflation. I thought about just inflation as just, just being inflation, but this concept of food inflation, I got to this when I realized that again, the price of an egg could be a dollar by late fall, just per egg. And so back when President Carter was in power, and I say in power, when, it, when, it, when he was in office doing whatever the heck he was doing, just trying not to kill, kill our country too fast. Uh, the food inflation rate was 8.1 percent back in 1980 and now here we are in literally biden's second year he's projecting seven and a half percent food inflation so it's basically the highest that food inflation has been since carter but the problem is that the usda has revised the food inflation rate i think already what four or five uh, four times in a row uh, <clears throat> on a month over month basis so if they're projecting seven and a half percent food inflation right now and a month ago, they were projecting five and a half percent. Like, really, at this rate, we're talking about like a 90, 19 to twenty percent like boost to food inflation. But that's where this idea that a carton of eggs could cost you twelve bucks comes from. What does that mean? Shoot, we're right now, Michelle. I'm so blessed to have a pregnant wife at home. I'm so excited. October twelfth is my due date, and I cannot wait. But <laughs> here we are seeing headlines about a baby formula shortage. What do me and why, what do my wife and I do? We prepare. And so we literally started ordering <clears throat> baby formula online. We're not getting a ton of it. We're not trying to stockpile like crazy because <clears throat> we know there are people that need it right now. But we got our first box of baby formula in and we ordered it from an American company. And the box that we got was totally in German. <laughs> so the <laughs> and we could we don't speak German. Like my mom was born on an American army base in Germany and my grandpa as a result spoke some German just to get around. So I know some words, but I, I can't read the freaking box, man. We're, we're getting baby formula now from Europe. Europe is bailing us out. And that's crazy. Food is super expensive. And then it's also scarce. What is that going to do <clears throat> to our economy? What's that going to do? 
I want, I want to encourage you to, the baby formula has been a really big issue. So as you're watching, listening, or reading, there are natural ways. People before mass production of baby formula had to do something. <clears throat> now, of course, nursing is the best thing you can do. And I encourage you work through those nursing issues. If you absolutely can't, then you can use, there's awesome recipes with a uh, powder or raw um, uh, goat's milk is a great alternative. You can use uh, lactose. There's vitamins that you can put in. They encourage cod liver oil, vitamin butter oil, uh, suppressed sunflower oil. There's just a, a whole lot of things that people have used and you can be just fine. We have created a reliance on the system that when it falls, we think we have no alternative. For crying out loud, when COVID hit, what was it that everybody flocked to? Freaking toilet paper. Right. Like, like we haven't been able to wipe our hind ends until the invention Michelle, of toilet my wife paper. Was like is everybody afraid that a side effect of, of COVID is that they're all just going to crap themselves? Like, <laughs> she was like, what are they so afraid of? Why is everybody buying all this toilet paper? And I was just like, sweetheart, I don't know, but let's go get some. <laughs> Gosh, yeah. So this is where we're at. And I'm telling you, Biden inflation is real. So it is that's real. And you know what? The Congressional Budget Office, a nonpartisan source, validated that the inflation that we're talking about today is policy driven. It's not because of Putin. It's not because of Ukraine. It's policy driven. Basically, choices that our, our elected officials have made have resulted in the inflation problems that we're dealing with today. And, and the first thing they point to is the COVID stimulus bill. And when you think about that particular bill, we're actually talking about billions of dollars here that are to blame for this inflation that we're talking that we're dealing with. We're paying workers to not go to work. And basically, the stimulus artificially slowed the recovery of the labor force participation, according to the CBO. Michelle, we spent a lot of money back during the COVID days. And I say during those days because I've gone. I know some businesses still require people to wear masks, but I think COVID's pretty much over. <laughs> Trillions of dollars spent, right? The, the American Rescue Plan was a $2 trillion bill. And not all that money, by the way, went to actual like COVID relief. You had stimulus checks going to to everybody in the country, not based on need. You had stimulus checks like 1400 bucks a pop going to mixed status families that also included illegal immigrants in the mix, people that were not even paying into the system. PPP went to Planned Parenthood. So there was, all, there was so much stuff going on there that I think was just a lot of pork in the barrel. And so you think about like, how could we stop this from happening? And there, there was a suggestion from the Democratic representative from California, Ro Khanna, and Ro is, he's one of those guys I think you could probably like have a beer with and have a conversation with, but he's still just too far on the left with his policies. He was recommending some three ideas that Biden should consider because he is pointing the, the finger at Biden here, unlike uh, a lot of Biden's cheerleaders. And he was saying that in his three ideas to fix inflation, he was saying, one, the federal <laughs> government should buy energy and resell it to Americans for less money. Two, Biden should assemble a task force to lower and stabilize short-term prices of volatile goods like food and fuel. And three, Biden should provide generous wage subsidies for American workers during the shortages. My first thought when I heard Ro Khanna's three recommendations, I was just like, man, sounds like a lot of big government. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like we're going to try and rely on the government to fix a government created problem here. Probably not the best path forward. That was kind of my take on that one. Yeah, here and here we are. We're we're floundering. We really are floundering. You you make a a good point. <clears throat> Twofold. Think about the things that you just said. One, a uh, big government coming in to solve a big government created problem. The that problem was created by people who just didn't know what the heck they were doing to a degree. There has been some peer reviewed studies, and this, my friend, is huge. Talking about, for example dealing with COVID and all of our mask mandates and our social distancing and our contract tracing. What did that do? They did some studies where kids were concerned and they found as many as five studies. It really did nothing. 
it did not it, it did not decrease the the amount of covid that came out of the classroom it didn't decrease the spread of covid or much of the severity and that can be argued but this is where we're at folks this is where we're at it really is. And now you're seeing that some of these decisions <laughs> that, that the government kind of made for the people. Michelle, the, the Buffalo shooter, he was bored because of the COVID lockdowns, this teenager. And he started finding himself in a combination of isolation and the internet, these like dark places on, on the internet. And mm -hmm. that's just one <clears throat> sad example from a, a kid that should have been in school, living the normal life of a teenager being pushed to excel, being pushed to, to thrive socially. But instead, he, he went down this terrible path that... And that's the extreme. A, a shooter. Another extreme is that kids 7 to 9 have the highest rate of suicide ever. In fact, it's the second leading cause of death. Suicide from yeah. little kids. Are you kidding me? Well, what the heck are we doing? And so that leads me to California, Adam, where mm. we're making a lot of dumb decisions that you just go, are you? Really? So they're get, things are getting weird in the People's Republic of California. Let's go through some of the news stories so that you Californians, you may know, the rest of the nation, look out. This could be us next. California uh, Respirations Task Force is now recommending two new state offices because... Oh. That's what California needs, Michelle. Ten new state offices. Yeah, let's, let's, let's just make the California government bigger. Let's yeah, why not? California For reparations state. in California, which, though it was a free state, if you look through history, there was some slavery in California. Blacks, not so much in very rare occasions. Hawaiians, Chinese, uh, Mexicans. These were those people who were enslaved, but they're not well, getting the, reparations. The, the it's Japanese only blacks. Camps as well in California during World War II. Yeah, so and I'm amazed at that. So if you're black in California, you can get those reparations. If you are actually a descendant of someone who was enslaved, a Hawaiian, a Chinese person, or a Mexican, not so much, you ain't getting it. Wow, that's weird. Okay, and really, you know what reparations really were? Reparations were tens of thousands of people who died on the battlefield in the civil war to free slaves that's freaking reparations we play we paid in our country with blood it's time that we walk on and stop making victims of ourselves don't like it that's okay you can send us an email with your outrage go for it san francisco's top high school top performing high school in San Francisco. Great education. Guess what? Now it has failing grades and those failing grades are soaring. Why? Because it used to be merit-based admissions. Now it's just a lottery. <laughs> so that's just ridiculous. Can you imagine being this kid who you work really hard for that A plus, you work really hard to be the valedictorian or the salutatorian? But really, you just, they basically give you a scratch off ticket. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, and, it's, this is insane. And what's difficult about that is in California as well, we have racist math. You do not want to allow people to excel too much because it is, it's a detriment to others. It's that idea of if you're fat it's and someone's skinny, they're skinny because you're fat. No, I'm fat because I couldn't put the damn cheeseburger down. You, you just don't get it. LI Unified is also warning of some big problems. You may mentioned and, and I had mentioned some of the mental health issues and mental health is a huge issue and so is drugs LI Unified warned of fentanyl problems three students just overdose oh. on fentanyl suicide rates fentanyl and now this in the recent in light of the recent tragic Texas shooting California State Senator Stephen Bradford put out a bill, SB 1273. Now, SB 1273 would no longer require schools to report violent crimes. So if you've got an active shooter 
on your campus, you do not have to call the police. They may not come anyway, and we're defunding them, so what does it matter? You do not have to report it. This bill would take the mandatory requirement for schools to report any violent threat to law enforcement as, as well. If a girl is raped in school, if there is a, an active shooter, nope, you're not going to report it. Schools don't have to report these threats to law enforcement enforcement because it could be racist it's absurd because basically what you're seeing these schools do is they're trying to basically in their words stop this school to prison pipeline and they're the keyword to look out for guys is this term restorative justice and i really encourage you guys to look up a guy named max eden from the american enterprise institute formerly of the manhattan institute and he's a researcher who's been looking into school shootings and school violence really closely he wrote a book called Why Meadow after the Parkland shooting for her, for her father. And basically he found that it's there, there's a correlation here where when schools stop enforcing the rules and when schools start to ignore the law, even in cases where you have students committing felonies, then there's a correlation with literally life altering or life ending violence going up by reducing suspensions, expulsions and in school arrests. Violence is getting out of control when you have no discipline. You literally have violence persisting, and that makes this, that makes the school an impossible place to, to learn in, right? You have uh, teachers and students alike being terrorized by those kids who are problems and who do need some sort of intervention, whatever that might look like, hopefully starting at the family level, but you have a lot of families that are not intact here, and that's also part of the problem. But these failures to identify and properly respond to those kids who are either breaking rules or breaking laws in school is basically going to lead to situations like what we just experienced here in Texas and Uvalde. And I'm sorry, um, I find it very racist and offensive to make the <laughs> assumption yeah. that we have to protect those ignorant, second-rate uh, people of color because they can't control themselves. We have to dumb down things because they're not quite smart enough to work their butts off and achieve a graduation status if we don't dumb everyone else down. That, to me, is horrible and offensive well, and, and you're wrong it, it, it is absolutely horrible and, and it totally deprives other like, basically all the kids including those kids from the minority groups and those kids that are in at-risk categories even if that individual kid is a high performer it deprives them of a fair education and it's really a tragedy and frankly it's shocking to me that you have a, a sheriff like scott israel from the stoneman douglas uh shooting he was the guy who was responsible and bragging about the reduction in, in arrests and the reduction in kids being uh, basically written up when, in fact, you had terrible things going on in that school district resulting in that terrible shooting at Stoneman Douglas. The fact that Sheriff Israel is now reemployed in a different city as police chief is just absurd. That guy should not be in law enforcement. He's a political hack. I mean, he's not, he didn't protect the environment or the, the community the way he should have. It's, it's a real shame. Yeah, it is indeed. And as we're talking about kids today, Adam, uh, this is the reality. 70% of public schools report a rise in students seeking mental health help. 70%. So how is that that whole CRT and querying your kids thing working? We're spending so much time telling kids that they shouldn't be happy with themselves unless they do something drastic. We spend so much time separating them with ridiculous policies in, uh, uh, with a virus that has almost no effect on kids. And then we live with the result of 70% of public schools a rise in mental health uh, issues with kids. Absent fathers, we're not talking about that. It's a big factor in mass shootings. It's a heated debate about gun control, and we know that. School safety, mental illness, it's a thing, but fewer zeroing in on the importance of the presence of a father. Studies, A study done by Warren Farrell, author of The Boys Crisis, Why Our Boys Are Struggling and What We Can Do About It, found that the leading factor in suicide rates, mental health issues and overwhelmingly in mass shootings fatherless boys mm. it's horrific that is terrible it's terrible that 
on one side you have a culture that isn't encouraging a family that should be intact. Even if those parents are divorced, both parents can still be very present for that child. And, and then on top of that, now you have the school districts, the public schools, taking in social programs that are designed to get between a child and the parents who want to be present. How absurd is that? You have parents that genuinely do care and do want to be involved, but then the school is saying, oh no, we know better. And by the way, we're gonna give your kid puberty blockers, even if it's gonna make that kid sterile and make you, mom and dad, unable to be a grandparent later on in life. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're also too, let's also remember too, the prefrontal cortex of a kid is not done developing until what, age 21? And, and that's part of that. That's part of the brain that kind of helps a kid understand what the long-term consequences are from a decision. Well, we so have our it's, it's president that there. wants to raise the legal age to get a gun to 21. So kids are not responsible enough to to get a gun until they're 21. But they're responsible enough to decide if they want to be a boy, if they want to be a girl. For crying out loud, kids identify as dinosaurs when they're at seven or eight years well, old. But yet they're able to make that kind of decision. Michelle, we have gone topsy-turvy. I saw this post on LinkedIn and it was a guy um, posting a, an image of his father back when his dad was a teenager in the 50s. In, in big cities and small towns alike, kids would literally ride the school bus with a rifle in their bag and they would go to school and there would be a shooting club and they would participate in shooting sports. And how many mass shootings were taking place back then? About zero. Literally, the culture has evolved to this place where we rely on medications and prescriptions to solve mental health issues instead of therapy and counseling and, social, and intact like, families we have people like families, B, exactly. we have organizations like blm who have actively said we are against the traditional family we're for the dismantling of the traditional family and meanwhile while we are still reeling from the uvalde shooting we uh, are still talking about it 40 people were shot dead 40 people shot dead or shot rather six dead 40 people shot six dead in Chicago over Memorial Day weekend. We didn't talk about that. The U.S. marked Memorial Day weekend with at least 11 mass shootings. And since 2018, over 100, 811 people have been killed in Chicago by mass shootings. But you don't hear any of that on the news. Nope. Like, wh why aren't they talking about that in the halls of Congress? It's just there's a big nope. there's a really good reason for that. Really good reason, oh, and we're going to talk about it. Let, let's get some of these statistics up that, that you've uh, sent to me. In Chicago, Philadelphia, New York, and Baltimore, these are some of the most gun-restrictive areas in the nation. The conversation we're not having is what's happening in places like this. Uh, and why we're on a gun grab? Because we have... Areas like Chicago with very restrictive gun laws. Canada, they invoked Uvalde as Trudeau froze out handgun sales. We don't want that stuff up here. And Great Britain, for example, there's been a meme that's been floating around. Have you seen it, Adam, where it says, hey, they got rid of their guns in Great Britain, and now they have zero school shootings. And I wanted to just address that real quick. Dublin, Scotland, was a scene of a school shooting and the death of 16 children and their teacher. Mm. And that was in the 1990s. And it prompted an almost total ban on private handgun ownership. It, it wasn't just all of a sudden, this has been going on since World War One, but it prompted an almost uh, complete ban. And that worked for them. No school shootings, right? Here's the thing. The UK is literally the league of shame. And here's why. Take a look at this. Their violence has skyrocketed. Number of violent crimes has just gone through wow. the roof. Robbery, burglary, homicide. That's a real thing. Adam, something else well, I want to take on. Let's look at what happened in the Ukraine. Yeah. They were giving guns out to every grandma and teenager because yeah, they needed Bavushka, to defend right? themselves and their country. <laughs> Got those armed babushkas over there in Ukraine. <laughs> and now <laughs> it, in Taiwan, more people are seeking gun training because what's taken place in 
the Ukraine is driving home the Chinese threat. So uh, finally, and I want to get your thoughts on this, Adam. When we look at what happened, for example, in Uvalde, we can see that there was a lack in police response. They're sitting in the hallway chatting it up while little kids are getting shot. There's more often than not, especially with this move to defund the police, a a slow response time. So who do you have to rely on? Let me answer that for you. Let me let uh, Trudeau answer that for you. Because as he's retreating on you being able to get guns, he's not volunteering for his armed guards to go anywhere. We have armed guards protecting Congress and those folks who want to take your handguns away. Who is going to protect you? And that's the the problem. If somebody in that school was allowed, they were busy pepper spraying and handcuffing individuals who wanted to go in and get their kids out or maybe do something or put themselves in, in harm's way so that they could protect other children. That's kind of a conversation that we should be having. I think about the UK kind of maybe start to think about what happened at the mosque in, in New Zealand and Christchurch, and you had 51 people murdered by a lone shooter. But then I thought about what happened in 2019 here in North Texas, where I am, where a shooter went into a church and then a member of the congregation and the church pulled out his personal carry firearm and shot the gunman dead from the back of the church to the front of the church and saved everybody that was in that, that was worshiping. When you think about a classroom, a classroom with an armed, trained teacher is very likely to be in a situation where a rogue gunman is sitting here for almost an hour, literally just shooting one kid after the next in the head. At, At a certain point, it does come down to us as individuals to protect ourselves when When we have seconds to make a decision like that, and it will take the police at best minutes to arrive to a scene, that's really what it is, right? Seconds versus minutes. And in a lot of cases, is a life and death difference. When you have places like Chicago, where just last weekend, there was a a 27-year-old sitting inside his apartment and rogue gunfire went into his house and killed him as he was watching TV. That kind of stuff happens. And that's random gunfire in a place that has the most restrictive gun laws in our country. And Uh, even with restrictive gun laws, Adam, in the UK, you can look up this article. I don't have it to show today, but they've been realizing that there are more guns being smuggled in. American guns, by the way. Thank you, USA. But (laughs) when you outlaw guns, only outlaws have guns. Even police don't have many of most of the police don't have guns throughout the UK. So as that problem grows, who is going to protect them? You can also juxtapose that with Switzerland, where every freaking person at a certain age is giving here's your gun get your gun everybody (laughs) has guns and how does that work for them fairly well hey michelle wait real real quick are you telling me that a criminal is going to break a law what like if oh what was i thinking that's designed to stop them from was that racist of me they're gonna follow that law it's absurd no that was racist of me i guess i should apologize (laughs) but then you think about just like what maybe drove the Uvalde Police Department to totally flub the response to that school, the defund movement, which if you're going to defund a police force, there's going to be a lot of lack of training there. There's going to be a lack of will. They're going to be afraid to do anything because they might get the blame. They might end up in jail. Who knows? It's a very hard environment, I think, for police to operate in these days. And communities have to rally around police as though they are neighbors. I think it's important that police know the people that they serve like you think about resource officers in a school i remember when i was a kid i went to a big high school i graduated from a high school with over a thousand kids and we all knew the police officer he was one of our friends but he was also he was the closest to the at-risk kids who really needed an authority source in their life so i think we have to find a way to really embrace those who pledge to serve our community the Uvalde situation is tragic, and we're going to have to really dig deep to really understand that one. I think what I saw, police stopping parents from going into the school to take care of their kids or to save their kids, a super trooper sort of, of conflict between the local police and the border patrol. It's like, I saw some really ridiculous things there that I think are not okay. But just generally speaking, I think we have to find ways to really come together as a community to solve this. 
and not fall into that trap that I think uh, a lot of the media and our lawmakers want you to fall into, which is making this a conversation about gun control because it's really about so much more. Indeed it is. And then I wanted to end with just a little bit of good news. As kids are floundering, flailing, and failing, there are people who are trying to make a difference. This is where it gets to the God story. Churches have been stepping up, and I just found out at my church that they're starting a what's called an open garage where they're going to teach kids in the neighborhood that may be high risk, don't have fathers. They're bringing back shop class with motorcycles. They're going to teach kids how to build motorcycles, fix motorcycles, teach them a trade, mentor them while they're doing it. I'm excited about that. There are things that are happening where there is a lack and we see the government failing individuals can and should step up that's kind of part of who we were created to be to make that difference to be God's hands and and feet on this earth and to be his love to the next generation you 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 remind me of a really good point too there is a disparity between levels of inner city violence in a place like Boston versus other parts of the country and the common denominator there in Boston was the churches were super involved in those inner cities And as a result, the kids were involved in those churches and they were doing great things together, getting away from the stigma of of drug violence and crime and all that kind of stuff and building things together, building futures. And I think that's, Michelle, that's awesome. That sounds like a lot of fun too. I want to participate. Right? Isn't that cool? I'm really looking forward to it. It's a reminder that I got this phone here and when the battery gets low, I need to get it connected we were created to be connected with god look at what's happening in our society and rethink your worldview if you think everything's going well the farther we get from those biblical values you might want to rethink that your worldview matters and so does the god story i would thank you for watching or listening we love having you and you know what it's so much fun to spend this afternoon with you taking on these issues adam and i look forward to it every week so we'll take extra care to look at the news the views and sort it through so that we give you accurate ideas another maybe another world view that you might want to revisit and uh, you know think it through for yourself thanks for watching and listening we'll catch you next time for more fun go to mymichellelive.com